Is it start? Rip. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, my presentation is going to be about Please Um and how it was adapted as a film by uh, director Tetsuya Oishi um, from the light novel by Nisio Isin. Um, mainly, I'm going to touch about how, uh, like, they're both the same story, but they approach it very differently. The light novel is almost told entirely through uh, internal narration and monologue uh, versus the the film, which uh, Oishi, I have a quote, quote from him later that uh, explains that he wanted to cut out almost all of that. So, uh, so naturally, they had to approach it very differently. Uh, so as an introduction, the Monogatari series is a pretty long-running show. Uh, the author is Nisio Ising, who wrote the original light novels. He's pretty well known for um, his wordplay and playing around with meta genre awareness um, and like with like the constraints of what a story can do and things like that. Um, so Baki Monogatari is the first season. Uh, it was directed by Tatsuya Oishi. Um, then Shaft locked him up in a basement for five and a half years, and then he made Kizu. Uh, Itamura, Tomoiki Itamura took over after Oishi, um, and he's adapted all the other TV series beyond that. Uh, and he's been pretty faithful to the novels, um, adapting the dialogue and monologues pretty faithfully. Uh, and, uh, you know, because that's, that's usually what people think about as the appealing part of Monogatari, even Oishi and Shimbo have mentioned it in uh, interviews how uh, the appeal is in Nisio's dialogue. So that's all more interesting um, how Oishi tried to approach Kizu by cutting out all the internal monologue, which is the vast majority of that. So that brings us to Kizu Monogatari. Um, it's like the second most recent entry in terms of uh, per when it was released, but it's actually the second novel release, I think, or third, I think, actually. Uh, and uh, chronologically, it takes place um, before all of the rest of the series. So this is uh, truly the beginning, uh, or at least in the in the light novel itself, uh, it sort of mentions that it's a beginning, and it's the beginning that he chooses to tell the main character, uh, Aragi. Uh, and uh, translates to Wound Story. It's a story about um, how relationships uh, like sort of rely on vulnerability and opening yourself up to being wounded by other people and as well as, you know, actual physical wounds, <laughs> as you can see in the pictures. Uh, so, yeah, uh, like I was saying, the production was announced in July 2010. It was released finally in January of 2016. Uh, so it's a five and a half year production too. It took a long time, but the polish really shows and I really want to talk about that. So here's two quotes from Tetsuya Oishi, the director. Uh, it's a story about beginnings. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, two first encounters, um, one between uh, Aragi and Hanakawa, and the other one when he meets uh, Kishat. Uh, and this all happened after a, a period of isolation in his life, uh, which is expanded on in Awari, uh, which is kind of late, but uh, the context is there. Uh, he does um, talk about this when um, in in the light novel and in the, uh, the movie um, when when he alludes to his worldview as uh, as being a loner because having friends would lower his quote unquote human level. It's sort of like his ex excuse um, for being for not having any friends, and that sort of relates into the uh, theme of uh, relationships and uh, not wanting to be vulnerable and hurt by their connections with other people. Uh, in, in the light novel, he like pretty much constantly just thinks about that like uh, in the part where he's talking about this, but he only really has like one line in the, in the, in the movie. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about um, two scenes from part one. So that's both of the, uh, it's going to be both of the meetings. Uh, so, um, 
the the main uh, difference between the films, like I and the light novels, as I said, is that uh, Oishi decided to cut out all the monologues. Um, so instead, he's going to try to tell the whole story through the visuals and the the audio and and the animation, how the characters behave, uh, how Araragi behaves specifically, because. You don't get any any of his uh, internal thoughts really in the first movie. Uh, you do get a little bit more uh, in the later ones, but still quite a lot less than in the light novel. So, uh, to quote Oishi, he says he did this so that the reader or the viewer could empathize better with Araragi, which is almost seems uh, contradictory, since you know you you know what, if you know what his thoughts are, then you know what his thoughts are. But if you don't, then you have to like sort of work at it. So um, he tries to. She tries his best to craft a, a scene in a way that um, uh, tries to uh, make you feel like you know what Aragi is going through with the lighting and the tone and the uh, atmosphere created by the soundtrack and the visuals. All right, so the first scene I'm going to talk about is uh, is a not safe for work warning, uh, just in case any of you guys are at work at, on on a Saturday night. Um, uh, next slide is a pretty infamous scene. Um, it's like a two page long thing um, due to its length. Uh, it's t told entirely through his internal monologue in in the uh, in the light novel, but obviously Oishi cut all of that out. So um, the approaches are very different. Uh, the film managed to cut out all the monologue, but still managed to capture sort of the same feeling, although it's not quite as absurd as reading it. Uh, so here we go. Uh, this is the, the famous panty scene. Uh, I think it's like two or three pages long. Uh, I have all of the text here. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty long. Uh, so it's not in the in the movie, it's not quite as ridiculous as like just constantly reading it and then like wondering when it's going to stop but it's still really creatively adapted like uh it, it's like bookended by these two shots of soccer trees uh one of them at the beginning it's um it has flowers on it at the end after the wind has blown the skirt up and stuff there's no more flowers so there's a lot of sort of like sexual imagery there uh you guys can read this later if you want Oh yeah, uh, I'm gonna have uh, quotes from the book on top of scenes from the movie is, is generally what the format's gonna be uh, from here on out. Uh, the, the light novel also uh, lampshades the length of the, the scene um, with Hanukkah like saying, what do you, why does it feel like I just had uh, two pages of uh, description of my panties or something like that? Uh, and the rest of the scene is pretty much um, straight from the novel, except uh, uh, it's it's done really well. Um, even the little character details, uh, like the little hop 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 thing, uh, are translate. They translate very well visually, and I think where she did a good job there. So there's a lot of attention to detail, small little things like that. Um, this is one of the first scenes in the movie, and. Uh, it's the first uh, first encounter, like I was saying before, which uh, and then the next one I'm going to talk about is the second one, where he meets uh, Kids Shot, Acerola, Orion, Hard Under Blade. That's a mouthful. I don't think I pronounced that correctly, but whatever. So uh, this one is one of my favorite scenes uh, in all the films, probably all of anime. Uh, it's the subway scene. It's not in the light novel. So um, the light novel sort of starts here uh, uh, with the single lamppost that's lit up, um, but there's no subway part. It just almost immediately cuts to uh, the shot of her. So this next slide is, uh, this is from episode one of Bakemonogatari. Uh, at the beginning, they sort of flash this. Uh, this is more faithful to the light novel. You just see the lamp, she's under it, and then boom, the scene starts, they just talk. Uh, Whereas in the movie, in the movie you get a you get this stuff you get like all this kind of shafty like intercutting. This says SOS in Morse code, and then um, you get this whole harrowing like suspenseful sec twelve minute long segment of um, 
just slowly walking with like this really suspenseful music uh, as, as you see all this gruesome detail with the red on the on the white, uh, you know, sort of like uh, uh, reminiscent of the Japanese flag, which is a motif motif that like shows up multiple times too. Uh, you get more of this stuff. Uh, just really, um, really interesting to look at. And then, like like I said, he's like walking down this place for twelve minutes. It's almost like he's descending into his own personal hell for the next two weeks of his life, which is what the light novel describes it as. So here's sort of where the light novel picks up, um, like where they come back together, uh, the movie and the novels. Um, uh, the light novel does build it up uh, like pretty well. It spaces it out more with the thoughts, like in terms of like physical page space. So it's the rhythm of it is sort of um, it parallels what the movie does. I think the movie captured that feeling really well, with the, even without the monologue, just adding that old subway scene with the suspense. Yeah, and this is where she's telling him. Uh, to give him her blood, or to give her his blood, and to, and it's the the fear, and uh, you can't see this because it's not animated, but like the character animation is really good here. Um, like Ara is just, it's just like the shakiest animation ever <laughs> with the character model, uh, and this this eventually turns into um, when she realizes that he's not going to save her. Uh, she she quickly turns and starts crying and apologizing. Uh, she doesn't want to die. Uh, and this next part is where he, he runs away for a bit. He sits down on the stairs and then he, he hesitates to leave. Uh, this scene's really uh, nice in the movie because, like, uh, Right before this is all hectic and stuff with him running away and then it just suddenly stops and all you hear is this uh, baby crying in the background. Uh, it's like uh, representing the her crying and, and he contemplates why, why, why would I go back? Why would I help save this monster with my life? And then he sort of comes to the conclusion that his life was up until now is not worth anything. So he's like, okay, I'll just give it up for this monster. And then she's super surprised by that, too. Uh, and yeah, so there's the lines from the, the novel. Um, there isn't a single reason for me to bother, to bother staying alive. And then it's, uh, so he does something stupid. And he per fully prepares himself to die. And of course, uh, he fails. And that's the end of part one that I'm going to talk about. There's still a lot in there, though. OK, so part two, uh, I'm going to briefly mention some differences in part two. I'm mostly going to focus on um, the, how the antagonists differ. So uh, in part two is basically the fight against the three hunters. Um, in the light novel, they get a lot more dialogue. Uh, and like they sort, there's sort of like a back and forth about like what, why they're hunting her, and then what their motivations are, and their speech mannerisms. But you don't really get too much of that in the movie. Instead, the movie tells it through the the fight animations, like how they behave when they fight, uh, what kind of things they try to do. Like guillotine cut or dramaturgy up here in the corner uh, is uh, he's like just. He keeps that face like the whole fight, <laughs> and and he's just really straightforward. Just wants to punch him in the face. Uh, this guy, he he also episode he keeps a like this cheeky grin the whole time because um, he's just kind of crazy. Uh, and then uh, uh, guillotine cutter, he's he's just the shadiest of the bunch, and he what he does, he kidnaps his friend and then tries to win that way. So. <laughs> Uh, you, you, there's a lot you can tell just from the way they approach things. So I think this is the weakest part, personally, out of the three. But um, it's still it's still really good. Like the the animation in the in the fights really brings um, 
really brings it to life. Uh, it really sells the how outclassed uh, Aragi is um, when fighting these uh, experts, these pros, uh, vampire extinguishers. So, um, and I think like uh, there's a lot of attention to detail. Like I think the, there's like one animator in charge of all the rain here that you can see in the background. Things like that. It's really nice. Uh, in in part two, especially, there's also like some pretty blatant um, 2001 references. Uh, this one was a was a humorous scene, and then these are sort of oh yeah, this too. Uh, yeah, and then um, there's also this match cut in part one that's pretty reminiscent of the match cut in 2001, and there's a couple of tracks in part two that are also sound really like the opening track to 2001. So it, it sort of ties into like the whole transcending humanity thing that's going on here. Our is turning into a vampire and becoming beyond human. So, and, and you got, you got stuff like this to just lighten the, the mood and you, you, when you combine all together, you get like a really unique, aesthetic and tone, uh, like with the horror comedy stuff. OK, uh, part three. There's a lot to talk about here, and I don't think I'm going to be able to get to it all. But um, it's where everything sort of comes together. Um, character motivations are revealed, and expectations are flipped on its head, their heads. So the first scene I want to talk about is the, the rooftop scene between uh, his shot in Aragi, uh, where they have, um, it's really uh, well animated like the rest of the movie. Um, and they sort of just talk about nothing. Like she just wants to talk because uh, she hasn't had really a chance to in hundreds of years. All she's done is fight people constantly. And so the main plot thing here is um, there's a bit on her, uh, about her first servant Aragi being her second one that she's ever made. Um, and it, it's told in, uh, like, the visuals are, were drawn by uh, Hajime Ueda, uh, who did most of, I think, most if not all of the Monogatari EDs, visuals, um, and some inserts. Uh, and it's a really distinctive style, as you can see there, uh, and it fits really well with the, the story being told. And it's like we get a sort of dark storybook retelling of her past with that servant who um, committed suicide. Uh, and we find out from her that that's a pretty common way for vampires to die. Uh, um, and that, that's a really important detail uh, that the, uh, the film actually doesn't go into very much. The light novel goes a lot more into detail about the uh, like suicide and, and vampires, uh, and like the whole being immortal, uh, boredom, things like that. Uh, I wish I had more time to talk about that or I researched it more, but that wasn't really the main topic here. So, uh, and then, um, this next one just skips to the fight, uh, between Aragi and Kishat. Uh, this is really the highlight of this movie. I think, um, uh, it's like a seven minute segment where they just, go all out, uh, the only way two immortal glass cannons really can, uh, just regenerating their body parts before they can even hit the ground. Like that top scene with the, 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 the heads. And then <laughs> this one I really like where she punches his, his, uh, his face and it, the skin flies off. Um, in the background here, uh, he's running away without a head and limbs. Uh, uh, it, it's just like really nice balance um, on that edge between horror and comedy and, and action comedy. It's a uh, really creative fight. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it before. So and it's really fun, too. And I think um, that's more reflective of um, how Kishot views the fight since she's never had to go all out in her hundreds of years of fighting. And then this is like her letting loose, sort of. But uh, as we find out later, that's also not entirely the full story behind her reasoning. And uh, so with the aftermath of the fight, um, we find out her uh, true motivation was to die all along. Um, when Aragi found her, she was sort of chickening out, uh, 
she came originally to die anyways, but at death's door, she regretted it and got desperate. So she asked him, not really expecting him to actually uh, help her. But when he did, uh, she felt like um, while sucking his blood, she felt like she could uh, she could die saving him instead. And that was the decision she ends up making, uh, resolving herself to make. Um, and then Ar Aragi finds this out, and obviously being who he is, um, he's not going to do that anymore. <laughs> Cause, uh, so he asks Oshino for uh, a solution to make everyone happy, and he says, I can think of a way that can make everyone miserable. And so uh, Aragi ends up making that decision. So it, it all sorts of builds up to the solution where everyone's unhappy with uh, these two who um, who would die to save one another, but would not accept the, the death of the other one. Uh, so the, the incompatible wishes sort of intertwine and arrive at this quote unquote solution. But it's more of like a stopgap than anything else. So uh, the film does this, um, it does, have this and it's definitely there but the light novel goes into a lot more detail and like sort of like uh supports it with like multiple lines of evidence like for example in the light novel Anika researches how to turn a vampire back into a human finds out that you have to turn on the master servant bond to kill the master so i mean they have that like explicitly there and then they hint at it all the time too but um i don't really think it was uh too big of an emotion because like you really do understand the character mo motivations at this point um but the light novel just like makes it crystal clear like sort of like hammers it in so that make sure you don't misunderstand and uh like walks you through Araki's like logic in arriving at the conclusion he does Yeah, so it, it just like sort of I I really like how it um like sort of they're two paradoxical but similar like uh, wishes ultimately like link up so that both of them live on but they're in a terrible situation where they both don't want to be in sort of an ending where everyone is miserable. Oh yeah, and and uh, one other thing I didn't mention was the um. So she, she decided to save him because she couldn't save her previous one because in order to save her previous servant, she would have had to die. So she had resolved herself to save him and die instead to atone, partly atone for her past uh, regrets, which she views as a mistake. So uh, some closing thoughts. I think the film did a fantastic job of interpreting and conveying the light novel also like taking a drastically different approach. Um, the light novel might make it easier to follow the plot or more logical in terms of following Aragi's uh, point of view, but I don't think the film really loses out on too much of that. Um, it really does uh, still capture the core of that thematically and all that. And I think the, the trade-off that the film gets uh, much outweighs what it loses. It's, uh, it's, it's like, it's a much more visceral and sensorial and sensual experience compared to the light novel. And I think uh, Oishi more, more than succeeded in achieving that sense of empathy that he was talking about before. Um, uh, there's some other stuff that I kind of wanted to talk more about, but um, I knew I wouldn't have time for it. I really want to look more into the suicide angle and how it loops back between the two main characters. Um, there's a quote from the light novel that says, uh, it didn't matter if I died, but it felt awful when other people died, which is sort of like the crux of what makes Aragi decide what he does in the end. Because um, he, he realizes that idea doesn't really hold up its hypocrisy. Uh, and then I also, I really, I do want to look at how the beginning, uh, like here in Kizu, ties together like fully with the whole series, uh, especially with Owari's conclusion, because they tie, they bookend the, the main series uh, really neatly. It's sort of like similar situations, um, but the the tone and approach are different. Like you, you can see how Aragi approaches it differently due to where he is uh, at the beginning and at the end. 
So, uh, in conclusion, the light novel and the movies tell the same story in very different ways, and they're both very successful. But the movie is uh, like it's just a very unique experience. Um, very well done by the great artists at Shaft, and I'm really excited to see the next thing Oishi works on. And here's some uh, stuff you guys can read about um, in terms of like, interviews and some production insight. Right, any questions? Uh, I can like upload the PDF if you guys want. Yeah, uh, for the visuals on, on the PowerPoint, I'm gonna be honest. I used the fucking the PowerPoint um, like automatic design thing. I found out was a feature yesterday, and it was actually not bad. So I use that. No, there's there's actually not any of the Japanese flag things in the in the novel. Um, that's like purely oishi. Like a lot of like. The visual stuff um, is almost purely oishi besides the, the character movements, which are actually surprisingly faithful to the novel. But yeah, um, I, I know me and Rand were talking about um, something like, we were kind of joking around about how Kiss Shot is Western and um, everything else is like, Japanese and how Aragi uh, in his like middle school isolation sort of almost represents uh, Japan's isolation and then like his uh, loner status and and all that good stuff and like Western influence things like that forming his new identity. <laughs> but that's that's a stretch. I'm I'm sure there's something there though. All right, I'll, I'll post these links. All right, thank you, Cal. Um, I guess we have a couple minutes. Uh, if anybody has any of the questions they want to ask any of the presenters still around. Uh, otherwise, thank you. This formally concludes all the presentations for the first r slash Chuanwei Blitz. Uh, we had a great set of presentations. Supposedly, Kai, I guess, will be uploading them online. So if you missed it, or if you know somebody who's missed it, I guess you can redirect them to his YouTube channel at some point. Um, I, I don't know if we'll host this, have something like this again. Uh, hopefully, they, we will. Maybe next year, uh, maybe sooner. Um, thank you, for everybody, for showing up. I've given everybody a, a role for, uh, for signing up. Uh, I won't be giving it out to anybody else or for being here, for being in attendance. Um, uh, I, I really had a really great time and I, I hope everybody else did too. Thank you.